Okay, looks like we're ready to start. Um, first of all, my name is Wes Speak. I'm the mayor of the city of Corona. Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the city of Corona's community conversations, uplifting black voices event. I'm excited to be here tonight to, to listen, learn and, and connect. Um, excited to see the three of you here and can't wait to hear what you have to say. Uh, this event will highlight the triumphs and challenges and rich cultural heritage of our black community. This will be an opportunity to build relationships have real conversations and learn how our black leaders are shaping Corona's history today. Uh, here in Corona, our vision is to create a community where everyone can thrive. And moments like these provide a perfect opportunity to create an environment where we can connect and build meaningful relationships with our community. I wanna thank the moderator and our panelists for being here tonight. Uh, this event would not be possible without the support of the community leaders like yourselves. Um, I'd also like to recognize the city council members in, in attendance tonight. I have uh, council member, uh, let's see, Tom Richens, somewhere, right, right, there you go. <laughs> council member Jim Steiner, in the back there. And uh, soon, or let's see, recent uh, new mama, council member Casilla, Jackie Casillas. Um, I'd also like to recognize that we have our city manager, Jacob Ellis, our city attorney, Dean Derleth, our police chief, Bob Newman, and our fire chief, Brian Young, in atten attendance tonight. Also, we have the entire leadership team here from the city, um, all the department heads, and uh, we're here to, uh, to, like I said, listen and learn. So again, uh, welcome, and I will now pass the mic to our moderator, Mel Campbell. There you go. Check, check. Good evening, everybody. Ooh, good evening. That was, that was, okay, all right, 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 drop it afterwards, all right? That was a terrible good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mel Campbell. I'm pastor at a small, uh, growing church fellowship, um, um, Fellowship Corona. So when we say good evening uh, or when we say hello, we, it, it has to be with a little energy. So um, I appreciate that. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us here um, this evening, um, uh, mayor and, and, and leadership, uh, city leadership. It is a privilege to be here. Um, it's a privilege to be here with, um, with my, with my uh, panelists as well. Um, thank you for being here tonight. We're going to just jump right in, um, I think, um, with um, uh, our, our program tonight. And that is where we get to speak um, freely about some questions and issues um, that we've dealt with, that we're dealing with, that um, uh, communities across the country deal with, not just us. Um, but we've got a diverse panel up here, too. And so this is not a, uh, this is not a monolith. It's not meant to hear one voice. Uh, you'll see that. You'll hear that uh, tonight. We've got uh, varying viewpoints. But what I want to get across uh, tonight, um, one of the most important things I want to get across is that there are differences and different viewpoints. Um, we, like one comedian said, we are not a monolith. Right? We've got different people and different ideas, uh, even within our community, just like we do uh, within the city. And so that will come across um, as well. It is um, with uh, great um, anticipation that we've been uh, waiting to get started um, and uh, have this, uh, this candid conversation. Well, to open up, um, I want to read you a quote, um, a quote from a dear friend of mine, a good friend of mine. Um, her name is uh, Brenda Salter McNeil. She wrote a book um, called um, Becoming Brave. Um, and in that book, um, she says, um, the Akan people in Ghana believe that all people are born with purpose and destiny written into their being. The Akan are mono monotheist and believe that no one is here on earth by accident. There's a reason why the God of the universe has summoned every human being to be born. Therefore, according to traditional custom of the, the Akan people, when someone wants to know a person better, they ask them the following powerful and prophetic question. What called you forth? In asking this question, they're essentially asking the person to discuss why they believe they were born. Perhaps the name they were given by their parents holds some insight into what they view as their purpose in life. 
by asking what called you forth, they're really interested in knowing why did God cause you to be born at this time in history? Do you know your purpose for being on the planet? What is happening in the world today that called you forth? With that, um, with that quote, I want to introduce, I want our guests to introduce themselves, the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, um, tell us who you are. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us your story and, and your purpose. And um, um, in, in just, just briefly. So my name is uh, Zariah McKnight. I believe I was put on, on this earth to serve um, and be a part of something that was greater and bigger than me. Um, I'm currently now in law enforcement, which uh, fulfills exactly what I, I want to do and what I believe my purpose is, is to be able to be an impact in people's lives based off of my, my experiences, my downfalls, uh, my uprises, and... Um, that's my purpose. Good evening. My name is Shirley Toller Hayes. Um, my purpose changed, um, I think, once I retired and my husband got sick. Um, my purpose before was to work in finance, make a lot of money, and just basically focus on, on myself and giving ourselves a good life, which is one of the reasons we moved to Corona. But once I retired, and I started to reflect on what I needed to do and what my purpose really was in life. And my sister passed too, so that gave me a lot of time to reflect. I um, decided that I needed to give back to the community. I, um, I work on the library board. My purpose in life is literacy, helping children learn to read, and everybody needs the opportunity to be able to have some place to go to read and um, get, a, get a good education. So that's basically it. Thank you. My name is Dominic Veretti. Um, I feel like mine would definitely have to be the simple fact that uh, I'm the son of an immigrant. The fact that, that my mom came all the way from India and, and, and met my dad here. And, and I think that God has a, a sense of humor, and I think that the, the two cultures are are so different in so many ways. But it's helped me; sh it's helped shape me to ho who I am today. And I think that my purpose is I kind of I feel like I kind of have two purposes. I feel like my pops taught me to lead, and my mom taught me to love. And so I'm just I'm living out my purpose right now. All right, I like that. Love and lead. Love and lead. All right, well, th thank you, um, panelists, for, for being here and sharing that part um, of your story with us. You'll hear, I'm, I'm sure, through the questions that we'll ask, more of, of who you are come, come out. Um, tonight, we're going to ask some uh, questions. Some of them are hard. Some of, some of them are tough, tough for us to answer in a, in a mixed, in mixed company, if I can put it that way. Candid conversation about how we feel, what we've experienced, what we're going through. And there's always a temptation when we get to this place where we're in mixed company to hold back and to think about not hurting someone else's um, feelings. Or, or, and and, and that, should be, that should be true. We should be careful uh, that we should be caring. We should be kind. Um, but we want to have a candid conversation um, as well. And so the conversation is going to be between the panelists, the questions I will ask. Um, and you're listening in on their, their ideas and their, their views and how, uh, how they see um, or how they'll respond uh, to these questions. And so this is the, the purpose of this is also to, for us to, to gather together more and become, by the end of this, feel like this is a little, we're a little closer as family, everybody. That's the word tonight. You're going to hear me say that word a lot tonight, family, family, because that's what we're trying to make corona. We're trying to make corona family for everyone. For everybody. And so um, it's all about family. So there are people in the audience tonight that are family that I don't know. You know, you get to that, you get to that family reunion, and, and I don't know Cousin Kim, and I don't know, you know, Billy Bob, and I don't know Susie Q, and I don't, not now, but the purpose is by, by the time we're finished here tonight, to be able to say, I know someone a little better. I trust someone a little more. I'm willing to do a little more and a little better in making this community um, family. And that's what we're going to try to do tonight. 
all right, through some tough conversation and through some good conversation. Well, first question. In 1903, W.B. Du Bois said, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. He said that at the dawn of the 20th century. Here we are two decades into the 21st century, and we're still dealing with the color line, color, race, ethnicity. We're still doing, we haven't figured it out. It's been a long time. What do you think, and any panelists can jump in, what do you think is the greatest hindrance to racial harmony here in the United States um, in this 21st century? And, and what are your thoughts on, on how to go about um, tackling that, solving that, resolving that? Anyone can jump in first. I'll go ahead and start. Um, I believe it's uh, education, uh, resources, and uh, perception. Um, creating programs directed at uh, the majority of issues that minorities face, you know, such as single family homes, um, judicial education, um, and single parents, you know, low income, making sure that they have access and the resources that somebody who's in a different situation would have. And I believe that that would help go ahead and uh, help us overcome some of those challenges and hindrances that we've faced in the past. I think um, Mr. Dubois was ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's a parent or not, this form of discrimination is woven into the very fabric of our society from our economy to our healthcare system to our education system. And I think it boiled over in 2020 with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. And I don't know how quite, how we're gonna quite overcome this because it's so inbred into us. Even though maybe it not, may not be spoken about in your home, because of your surroundings, it's part of your identity and who you are. Um, for me, um, I think it's economic inequality. I mean, if we're, if, if money talks, so let's talk money, right? So I think that, for example, the simple fact that the average uh, household income for a white family is, in 2019 was 76,000, and in, for, for a black household, it was 46,000. That's a huge gap. Um, but what's more concerning is the simple fact that uh, from 2000 to 2019, uh, white households' average income went up 6000 whereas black households went up $500. And so we talk about <laughs> programs, we talk about opportunities, um, but let's, let's focus on, on quality and not quantity. I think we, we talk about how many jobs are provided, how many um, you know, opportunities are provided, but like, are these quality opportunities, are these quality jobs, um, I think the black community needs quality jobs, quality health care, quality education. Um, those are the things that, that matter the most. And I think that ec economic equality is what's, in my opinion, it's what's, what's held us back a little bit. And um, those are some conversations that, that, that are, are necessary. And so that's kind of how I feel about that. All right, hard question and hard, hard follow-up question to that, all right, for, for anybody to jump in on. Uh, the opportunity for um, that because this is what I hear from a lot, of, a lot of family members. The opportunity for that black household to make more money is there. Is it? Or they've got the same opportunities that everyone else has to make money, to make more money. Do they? they to a certain extent, that could be true. But if you look at... Every, the people that I know, and to get where I got in my profession, you have to have somebody that helps you give a hand, get a hand up. They had affirmative action when I was in college, so I was able to go to a good university. They had grants and loans, so I was able to pay my way through college that way. Um, when I got my first job in Los Angeles, I had a mentor, and um, he was a Caucasian attorney at the firm where I worked, and he took me under his wing, and he was quite open about it, uh, myself and another girl in the San Francisco office. And he said, you know what? I'm going to make you the best trust officer 
um, estate planner that there is in Los Angeles because he was the number one estate planner in LA. And I truly believe that without his help and his mentoring, it never would have happened. Um, I agree. I agree with Shirley. Um, I also think that there, there are a ton of obstacles. Um, we could talk about, we could, I mean, this question can go on and on. We could talk about redlining. We could talk about predatory loans uh, for people of color. Um, but I think the, the biggest point is, like I, like, I, like I mentioned before, that don't just um, provide an opportunity or a program or a grant to check off a box. See it through. See it through, you know? Uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I call myself old. I'm feeling older and older every day. Um, <laughs> and I have, um, at, 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 here's my confession, at 55, I'm 55 years old. I was not, when I was born, born into a country with all the rights and privileges that the Constitution guaranteed me. Not when I was born. That's interesting. Because I tell my children all the time, I've got three, three kids, they are the first generation that was born in this country with all the rights and privileges guaranteed in the Constitution. We weren't fighting in the 60s for civil rights, for everybody to have rights. I want you to let that sink in for a minute. We are living in the first generation. My kids hear it all the time. You're the first generation in our family born with all the rights and privileges. We're in that first generation of making it right, getting it right, that's deep. That's deep because there's some deep-seated history that's still living and active and present. I knew someone I ate dinner with, I lived with, I lived with someone who knew a former slave, my Aunt Leola. Well, I grew up with her and she knew Former slaves, we're that close. We're not that far removed. And we're in a generation trying to fix these things. When Du Bois says, listen, this is going to be a problem, I think he was wise because he knew it's going to take a generation or two or three, but we got to lay the foundation. And I agree with you, Dominic. Economic is a lot of that foundation. I agree with you, Shirley. Education is a lot of that foundation. In, um, um, so um, we, we have to understand that context. This, we've, we've got to give ourselves some, some more time, some more time, but um, we need that help in moving forward. We need to be working together moving forward. That was a, that was a sidebar, my, my, my apologies. <laughs> Next, um, let, let's, let's go a little further. Um, we've heard prop, uh, people dealing with these issues. Uh, with the issue uh, of um, racial prejudice and, and um, dealing with it on a personal level. I'm going read to a, read a definition for you out of dictionary, dictionary.com. Um, a microaggression. Microaggression is a subtle but offensive comment or action directed at a member of a marginalized group, especially a racial minority, that is often unintentionally offensive or unconsciously, reinforce it, or, or unconsciously reinforces a stereotype. Um, microaggressions such as, I don't see you as black. That's, micro, that's microaggression. Racial prejudice, unreasonable feelings, opinions, or attitudes, especially of a hostile nature regarding um, an ethnic or racial group. That's racial prejudice. Panelists, do you, are these terms synonymous to you? Um, how, if ever, have you experienced or dealt with either one of these? Um, anyone, Joe? So uh, I started my first um, business in 2009. I was 19 years old and um, private security where I had to obviously obtain clients and try to gain business. And so I would do that by going to these different businesses and trying to offer my services and obviously being young, black and tatted, it didn't work. Um, so then I started getting behind the phone They'd have a conversation with me, and then that would kind of open the door to, hey, yeah, we'll accept a proposal for you. And then when they actually meet me, they go, you look nothing like what you sound like. So that then was a hindrance. So I had to become a master at closing deals over the phone, which made me stronger, right? And um, I had to be strategic in that. 
And being professional is a universal standard in any business for separating or evaluating the opportunities that one is going to give to another. And I had to master that over a telephone. So I did experience it. I want, I want to say, Brother C, you, you speak very, very well. The King's English, bro. You, you've got to, if I can say that. <laughs> Thank you, you sir. speak very well. And I can see where that came from and where you would have to do that, too. Right. So we, we know when we pick up the phone, we know this, right? Pick up the phone, you know who you're talking to when you pick up the phone. You know if you're talking to us or if you're talking to someone else. There's, there's just that tone, so a tone in our voices. And so um, I hear that, but you speak very well. And I don't know if that's offensive to you, um, but that's got to be helpful in a world where you're dealing with what, what you're dealing with. Anybody else? Microaggression versus racial prejudice. Same thing, not, or not? It's, I'm not sure. I faced the same issue he did. Um, answering the phone, speaking to clients. My clients were in the top 1%. And I would speak to them over the phone, and then I would meet them. And when you walk into the conference room, they would be like, you said top 1%, top 1% of 1 what? 1% of the wealthy in Los Angeles. And I would walk into the room with my boss, and they would look around like, well, we're Shirley, <laughs> the person that I talked to. And they go, oh, you don't speak like a black person. And I found that to be offensive. Uh, for me, microaggressions, uh, I'm not a big, big uh, fan of labels. And microaggression definitely is a term that makes a person who's racist a little bit more comfortable, right? Let's, these subtle, these subtle jabs, let's just call it what it is. If you're going to be racist, say it with your chest. Say it with your chest. Don't, don't hold back. Don't be subtle. And because um, there's, there's only one thing more dangerous than someone that's blatantly racist, and that's the person that is, is quietly racist, the person that doesn't see color. We want you to see our color. We want you to know our color. We want you to know our culture. So <clears throat> microaggression is, I don't, I don't use it. I don't use the term. I'm not a big fan of it um, because in a way you're ignoring who I am and um, just dismissing it, you know? And so, yeah, of course, uh, growing up in Crown, of course, I've, you're not like every other black guy. Uh, Z, for example, Z, I mean, Z speaks extremely well and there's a thing that we, in, in our community, call code switching, right? Everybody, everybody that's the same color as me here is code switched at least one time, and it's been with law enforcement, right? You get pulled over, you're like, yes, sir, you're everything. And we should respect law enforcement, but it's definitely, that's the, that's the, the first time that I, that I realized, like, hey, this code switching thing is real. And, but it's also not okay. We need to be un unauthentically unapologetically ourselves at all times. And I think that uh, microaggression is good for, for some, some spaces. It's just, for me, I'd, I'd rather you just tell me how you really feel. It's a nice word. Yeah, it's a nice word. Trying to cover up a harder word. What if we're just trying to have the conversation? What if I want to have the conversation and, and, and me calling it microaggression will allow somebody else to start the conversation? Is that okay? Um, or, and, and I'm just throwing wrenches to make, you, make us talk, you know. So um, we, we've got to start the conversation somewhere. We've got to start the conversation. Does it have to be on this level? Racial prejudice, you're a racist. Can it be on the level of, you know, you, you might not be racist or may, may not know you're racist or may not. So if we call it something softer, we can start the conversation. Uh, what about that? Well, you know, my, Maya Angelou has a quote. I'm big on Maya Angelou quotes. Okay. Um, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. I, <laughs> I can still be friends with you. I mean, just let me know how you really feel. And we can have a discussion. But don't pretend like you're not a racist. And don't pretend that you want to be my friend. If you let if you just be honest with it. What if I don't know? What, I'm, I'm talking to a white friend of mine, or I'm talking to somebody else, and, and the, the white friend does not know. They use the term, I just don't see you as black, I, I, or I never saw you as black, or, 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 or you're not like them, whoever they them are. What, what, if, what if they don't think or believe that they really are? Some don't. 
You got to pause. Listen, white folks, pause. <laughs> Think about what you say before you say it. Just take a deep breath and pause. It's, it's okay if, it, if it's this weird silence. We'd rather have that than, than the awkwardness that proceeds, right? And I think, I think to your point, I think we talked about it, that the best way to, to amplify black voices for white people is to do it in white spaces, right? Don't do it with us. We expect you to be like that with us. Do it with people in, you know, at Thanksgiving with Uncle Ernie. Do it at Easter. Do it when you hear someone speak something that's crazy. You don't have to, you don't have to disown that, that, that family member, but, but stick up for us every once in a while because it's going to take allies. We're not going to be able to do this by ourselves. It's going to take every single person in the audience to, to put their foot down and, and start to uh, move the needle forward. And, that, and that's, <laughs> it's, it's moving slow. You know, some people would say it's moving really fast, but we're, we're having a conversation like this tonight in 2022. So um, I think the, it's important to make sure that we understand that the best way, like I said, to, to amplify black voices is to do it in white spaces. Yeah, I, and that was very well said, Dominic. I, I think I agree 100% with you. Very well said that um, the allies, there's, there's got to be, um, there got to be the allies. What we do often is we say to ourselves, and I'm talking about our white brothers, white um, brothers and sisters in the family. Um, when we say, when we say to us or to someone that you know, you're in the black circle and, and, and you're, you're down and you're cool and you understand and you're, you're not racist with me, but you go home or you go somewhere else and you're in another circle, another white circle, it's not just, um, it's just it, the solution will not happen. We will, we will be in this spot 100 years from today if, if we um, continue doing it the way we are, which is um, we don't say the things we need to say in the spaces that we need to say them. So it's okay for white, me and the white brother to be talking and, and him or, or express uh, his disconcern, I mean, what he's um, you know, concerned about or uh, issues in the black community or things that are happening across the nation or whatever, and he's showing me the sympathy and the empathy and all that stuff. But then he goes home and he hears it in another circle and he doesn't say anything. See, that's where a lot of the problem is. We let it go, like you said. And, and so it needs to be said in all the right circles, in all the circles, uh, as opposed to just in front of us or just in this audience, just in this space. You're going to be in a space where there is no other black person. Then what will you say? And then how will you say what, what you say? That's, that's, that's a great point, Dominic. Um, OK, um, harder question, uh, I think. Um, I'm going to read you another quote. An NAACP magazine published an expose about investigative arrests and police brutality featuring a major U.S. city as the main example of illegal and unconstitutional policing. The white mayor and police commissioner denied the existence of any problems of, um, of racial discrimination, police brutality, and abuses of power by the police department. The traditional civil rights organizations like the NAACP, the Urban League, the American Civil Liberties Union, they led the, city, the city's police reform movement. These groups sought to make the police brutality and misconduct visible and demanded a civilian review board to oversee the police department. They also called for better training of police officers and for the police department to hire more African Americans to reflect the racial population of the city. What I just read sounds like today, doesn't it? Sounds like the issues we're dealing with today. That was from 1958 the city of Detroit, 1958. And it sounds like I was reading something <clears throat> published today, about today. Question, as we jump into the law enforcement um, se uh, section um, of questions. <clears throat> do you think, the question is about solutions. What do you think about solutions? Do you think the racial makeup of a community's police department should be similar to the community's racial makeup it serves, or is this unnecessary? <clears throat> or, in, in your opinion, um, what measures do you believe will work best? I read you a few from 1958. Um, what do you think? Comments? Officer McKnight, let me hear you, bro. Let's go. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> looking the at the cop like, what you gonna say? <laughs> All right. Um, I believe it plays a factor. Uh, in one's assumption or comfortability upon contact with a peace officer in that community um, based off the racial makeup of that particular community. I believe it 
is necessary to show possibility to the community, right? So if you're in a predominantly Hispanic area or African American area, and there's constant contact with law enforcement that don't look like them, then they don't believe it's possible, right? Um, and that's their hero. Most people want to be firefighters or cops when they grow up, right? <clears throat> and if every time you see that cop or you see that firefighter that doesn't look like you, you don't think it's possible. And so it's easy to marginalize this profession. Um, however, the training standards are different throughout the nation. Um, narrow it down to specific issues within your community and have that dialogue with the community um, based off of the community's concerns. Be transparent as a law enforcement agency. And like Dom said, you know, don't just have the conversation. You know, the next step is to act and implement on both sides. Um, it's a transparent relationship that needs to be had where there's trust on both sides at all times. Um, because when you have that critical incident and you have to do something that no human being wants to do to another human being, then the citizens of the community trust that you made the right decision and you did everything in your power to, to safeguard that community. The officer isn't the only one that's got to answer. You can answer. All right, I'll go next. So I, I definitely think representation matters. Uh, it's important that uh, the black community knows and sees officers in uniform. And like your, uh, the passage or the, the story you wrote about, you know, it was in, 19, in the 1950 and we could, um, and it, it did sound like today, it sounded like today. Um, Corona right now does not have a black cop, not a single black officer. We don't. We don't. So if representation matters, then that's something that we need to, you know, I know, I know it's tough. Like it's, it's easy to say, hey, we don't have a black cop. Let's get a black, I mean, we gotta have people that apply. We gotta have the right candidates. I get all that stuff, but um, it should be a priority. Um, we have, we, I think the black community makes up six or 7% of Corona. And I think that that's important. But <laughs> the bigger thing for me is, is um, policing, right? Is, is accountability and why we're policing certain areas and, and what those areas look like. Um, but ultimately, I have this, this wish, and it, it'll never happen, right? Because it's, it's extremely dangerous. But I, I think that police officers should live in the communities they work in so that they understand the, the pulse of the community. They understand, they know the community leaders, they know parents, they know sons, they know daughters. Could you imagine if uh, the police officer that shot 12 year old Tamir Rice, when he drove up to Tamir, Tamir Rice, said, hey, knock it off. Knock it off, Tamir, and knew him by name. Um, it's important that uh, along with being proactive, right? Because you hear the word proactive get thrown out a lot. Um, but that's, it's, we, we got to, like I said, we got to stop checking off a box. We got to get out there. Historically, the black community does not, tr does not trust law enforcement. And it hasn't changed because of the, the current climate we're in now. And so it's, it's the, pro the problem to me is systemic. And it starts at the top. You know, people say poop rolls downhill, right? It starts with leadership. You ne we need to understand that we need to hold leadership accountable in all, in all walks of life, not just law enforcement. But it needs, to, it needs to start there, and we need to have conversations like tonight. We need to have these, these, difficult, these difficult conversations, but necessary conversations that, that, push, that push us in the right direction. But um, yeah, for me, sorry I'm rambling, but for me, it's important that uh, those are some things that are taken care of. It, it's not just poop that rolls downhill. <laughs> good stuff rolls downhill too, yeah. right? Yeah. Grace and goodness and good things. Yeah. My husband is a retired police officer and um, he was one of the very first officers hired in Costa Mesa. And um, he wanted, I guess, more excitement. So <laughs> we, he transferred it to Los Angeles. And he always said that it was the only job he would have done for free. He was a military police officer. He just lived and breathed police work. And I think the fun came out of it he, um, when the riots happened. He said, I can't do this anymore. It's not fun. He was one of the cops that walked the beat when they walked beats, and they were assigned to a specific neighborhood. So um, I'm pretty sure that they probably should have 
specific police assigned to the community that you're familiar with, especially if there's children around. I have a good relationship with Corona PD. I mean, I live on the street with one. I mean, I know a lot of them from working through the city and Rotary. So I've never had a bad experience with an officer, but we have different conversations with our children based on whether they're male or female. The female son, you, the, your male son, you say, when you get stopped by a cop, turn your phone on immediately, start recording, be very respectful, put your hands on the wheel. You have a totally different conversation with your daughter. I mean, never said those things to a girl. And I, I think I can, I can agree with you on uh, Corona Police Department has never uh, given me like a hard time. I think that our cops in Corona are extremely talented. I think they're extremely professional. But the reason, I, don't, get me, don't get me wrong, I don't hate cops or dislike cops. I just like bad cops. We need accountability. That's it. And, and it's, when I went to, last year I went to Minneapolis for George Floyd's memorial and spoke, it, spoke out there. And I came back and uh, what, I, what I came back with was that we're, it can happen here. Just because you know, we, we might not think that that can happen here, but it could happen here. And why not be proactive and get out in front of things and have conversations and and have uh, committees or have sit downs so that it doesn't happen here. Because I want to be able to go out to other communities across Southern California and say, hey, Corona, Corona's cops, they're legit. They're the real deal. I want to be able to do that. Um, and so um, I, to, 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 your, to your comment about your husband working the riots, I, I lived in LA during the riots. You know, and the Rodney King's daughter is in the audience right now. Um, so it's, it's just the correlation, um, and it's, it's how small of a world it is, um, is important. But yeah, I, I, I agree. Corona, I, I do agree. I don't want to. I don't want to give Corona too much of a hard time because they're they're all right. Yeah, well, the <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, in in, uh, in in 1958, they started working really hard in Detroit about trying to get it together. They they disagreed with having a civilian review, review board and disagreed with a lot of things. They couldn't get it all together, but they were working on it. They were working on it. They were working on it for a year or two, trying to talk it out and, and work it out. But in the summer of 63, Cynthia Scott was shot and killed, a black woman, in the middle of the community. Lit a torch. Lit a torch. Like Dominic said, it could happen anywhere. And sometimes we think, not here, not... Corona, nothing like that is going to happen or could happen in Corona. It could happen anywhere. We have to be ready for if and when it does happen. We have to have this relationship good before something like that happens. We have to feel like this is family and something bad happened in family, but, and we gotta, we're going to struggle through that bad thing, but, but this is family, and we have a little more trust that that's what we're going to do, and that's what we're working through, and, 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 and that's just so critical, critical. So uh, the, um, there, has to be, there has to be fellowship before the conflict. Conflict is going to come. We have to build this community before the conflict, community before the conflict, and we'll get through it. We'll get through it much better. And so that's the proactive. I, I, I'm, I'm right. blessed the way you're saying that. Can that's, I touch on something? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so... Dom stated that he believes law enforcement officers live in the community in which they work. <clears throat> I highly disagree. <laughs> um, because most of your responses are to, you know, people in crisis. Um, and sometimes those wind up in you having to take people to jail um, or take a life, you know, or they have a bad interaction with you and that's where your family's at, right? Um, however, to piggyback on what you said, what I do believe is that <clears throat> when looking at applicants, what do you consider life experience? And that was one of the biggest challenges that I had as a getting into law enforcement, is that in 2013, I was involved in a shooting where someone tried to take my life and I had to defend myself um, using justifiable uh, force, causing me to discharge a firearm. Um, that was in 2013. A month later, my brother was murdered in the city of Corona. A month after that, I was blessed with my beautiful daughter. Ten months after that, I went through a custody battle that wound up in restraining orders and all kinds of stuff, right? And made a decision that I was going to put myself into the police academy. Nobody was going to give me a shot. Nobody was going to hire me. I'll pay myself. I'll go myself. 
I'll make the sacrifice. And I knew that when I was in that police academy that I had a chip on my shoulder, that I, I had to outshine, I had to stand out more than everybody else because not only was I African American, have tattoos, but I also had this, what, what we would call baggage, right? That's what some would call it. I call them lessons. Um, and even after graduating, I graduated the police academy, I was top physical fitness, top shot, number one overall, class president. Still couldn't bust down the door. Somebody gave me a shot. My current agency decided they were gonna give me an opportunity. Uh, in 2020, I got officer of the year. I haven't had to use force in two and a half years as a police officer because of my experience. Because a lot of the things that I encounter is stuff that I've been through. And people that I deal with, it's important to be authentic and don't let the uniform dictate how you're gonna treat somebody, right? Treat people as human beings and treat people how you wanna be treated. If you take somebody and you consider life experience, somebody who can pay their bills on time, right? Um, somebody who went to college and got a degree, oh, they were disciplined enough to do that. But then you put them in a hostile situation and they pull their firearm because they were scared or they'd never been around it, right? That might be your liability right there. Um, so I am very grateful for the things that I went through and I'm, I'm grateful to now be in this industry because now I'm intentional about making an impact on every encounter and being judged as a human being before I'm being judged as a police officer. I, I think critical is that experience right? that, that you bring, that you bring to it, that you bring to uh, your service um, to the community. And I think um, no matter what, um, just to um, piggyback in, or slide into the next question, no matter what we do, no matter what baggage or lessons we bring um, to any, any job or, or work that we want to do or service that we want to do, we bring um, some bias. We all do. Everyone does. Uh, our life has just given us that. Life gives us those biases. Um, sometimes we see and recognize those biases. Sometimes we don't. Um, do you think that we need to have that kind of um, training or education that law enforcement um, 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 uh, folks should have some kind of training in bias, uh, unconscious bias, bias, con uh, conscious bias, whichever one. But um, do you think we need to we need to have that kind of ongoing training? Yeah or nay? Yeah or nay? Officer, <laughs> it's always the officer. Um, yes, I believe I believe we should have ongoing training uh, for bias. What? <clears throat> I, I agree. I think we definitely should have uh, ongoing training. Um, the, but let's talk about the training. Uh, Computer-based training is, I, I, and it's funny because I'm going to say this, and people that have to do computer-based training at work, they might say, no, it's effective. Or they might say, uh, it's, a, it's a snooze fest. I feel like one of the things that he talked about was, I mean, with mental health being such a huge thing right now, mm. uh, with so many family members being affected by mental health, um, there needs to be more training, especially in that field. There needs to be more uh, bias training. It, it just can't be done on, on a computer. Like, we need to have, um, we need to, to I, my opinion is I think we need to hire a third party organization that comes in and helps our law enforcement and surrounding law enforcement agencies see to, see to it that things are handled the right way. Um, and I don't think that two to four hours a, a, a year Suffice. That's not. That's not enough. Like, I could if I talk to you two hours in a year. I don't. I don't even know you, man. Like, two hours a year is nothing. Let's let's sit down and like I said, let's not check off the box. Check the boxes. Let's let's get after it and and really try to dig down deep and figure out a way to understand the pulse of all communities, not just your community. Every 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 part of Corona, and I think that starts with with real training, like. I, Computer-based training to me is, is a joke. I, I, I like what you're saying, Dominic. I, th I think I like what you're saying because what you're really saying is there is no substitute in building family. There's no substitute for personal interaction. None. None. We, we have to, to get to know each other. Um, we have to 
we have to have that personal inter interaction. You cannot skip over um, the idea that um, a lot of us, well, I heard someone say this once. Someone said, if everyone at your dinner table always looks like you, you might be a racist. If every day, all, all the time, everyone around your dinner table looks just like you, either, either way, black or white, you might, you might be a racist. We have to get to know each other. We, I have to rub elbows with. I've got to know people. I, I've got to understand people. There are, there, are, there are some of us who, when Dominic mentioned code switching or whatever, we, we know how to walk in both worlds. We step over here, and we talk, and we speak a certain way. Walk over here, we talk, and we act, and we speak a certain way. There's no substitute for somebody knowing and understanding you and me than interacting with us. Absolutely, and I think that there's... When I, I'm harsh on computer-based training, but it could change your mindset. It can change the mindset, but will it change your behavior? There's, there's a ton of studies out there that talk about um, how computer-based training will, will, can affect the mindset, right? But statistics have, have, have told us otherwise uh, in terms of behavior. Um, and like you said, I think it's very important that human interaction, right, that we humanize one another and we... And, we, and I'm able to communicate with you and sit down and learn and, and have uncomfortable conversations. I mean, I'm sure some of the stuff that I'm saying tonight is uncomfortable for some people, but um, I'm not here to make you guys feel comfortable. I'm here to keep it real. I'm here to be honest, to be transparent, and hopefully, you know, afterwards, pull me to the side. You can tell me that I suck. You can tell me that I was great. You could, but I just want to be honest with you guys because it's important that Tonight, if, if, if we take anything away, that, that transparency and accountability and, and trust in, in our community with law enforcement is so vital. It's so vital. We got to stop having these conversations. It has to stop at some point. And it, I just hope that it stops in my generation, that, we're not, that my kids or my grandkids aren't up here doing the same thing that we're doing. Yeah, and uh, the, the big 50 cent word is um, for reconciliation to happen. The word is reconciliation. Um, there's a direction to reconciliation. If we're going to fix this, if we're going to make it work, it can't just be unidirectional. It's got to go both ways. So here's what typically happens. Um, when we want to fix a problem and someone's a little uncomfortable with fixing that problem, getting and having and maintaining home court advantage makes them feel a little more comfortable. You come to me. You come where I am. You come to where I'm comfortable or more comfortable, uh, and we'll work this out. We'll try to work this out. It doesn't work that way. We, we've tried that. We've tried that experiment a lot. It takes a lot of humility to step forward and say, I am uncomfortable here in your house, on your court, in your place. Teach me, right? Or help me or, or, or whatever. That takes a lot of humility. We are comfortable with going one direction typically. We got to work on that. Yeah, because if you guys are uncomfortable, I mean, black people are uncomfortable every single day. So, <laughs> so, so let's all be uncomfortable and fix it. Uh, or let's all acknowledge that discomfort yeah, right. and fix it. You know, Maya Angelou has another quote that I love. <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead, Maya. <laughs> and I wrote it down because I didn't think I would get it correct. Um, I've learned that people will, will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them. And I think when officers or anybody in authority deals with someone, they need to realize how they're leaving this person and what their feelings are. Absolutely. All right. Um, until someone points at, at a clock or, or at me, you know, you, you, you know the saying, the, the preacher was preaching and he kept looking at his watch. You heard that, right? Preacher was preaching, he kept looking at his watch, and the little girl talked, uh, pointed, looked at her mother and said, Mama, why does he keep looking at his watch? What does that mean when he keeps looking at his watch? And Mama said, not a thing, baby. It don't mean <laughs> a thing. So until somebody tells me to stop, we're going to roll. We're, gonna, we're just going gonna to keep going. We just got, a, a, I think, uh, a few more uh, to go. Um, racial trauma or racial-based traumatic stress, RBTS, it refers to the mental and emotional injury caused by racial bias or ethnic discrimination or racism or, or hate crimes. Racial trauma affects our communities, mental, emotional, and physical health. Black children stress 
while living in predominantly white communities. I want to move the conversation to our kids and our children in a community where they are the minority. Did you attend school as a racial minority? Or were you a minority in number at your school? How did it affect your mental health? And uh, added on to that, how are your children dealing with it today, here in Corona specifically? I mean, Dom, you went to Centennial. You can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did go to Centennial. But I also, I was raised in a lot of white evangelical churches, right? I played baseball, a sport that is around more whites than any other. And like I said, I grew up in, in Corona. So um, I definitely was what one would say uh, the token, right? That's a microaggression, right? Hey, you're the, you're the only guy. You play baseball? That's crazy. Why don't you play football or basketball? I mean, I did, but um, to Z's point, um, this is probably easier for Z because he went to Santiago. And that... <laughs> and that and uh, and we know the demographics. Not to my sharks. We know the demo. Well, we know the demographics there, right? So, um, but yeah, definitely. I work with foster youth um, on a on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. I I mentor twenty kids a week, and uh, unfortunately, eighty seven percent of the kids in foster care are kids of color, and so there are some obstacles that these kids face, um, and. There are plenty of traumas associated with, with that. I mean, some of that is from their, from their past, but some of that's current, you know, and there's a lot of, I think that we often mistake uh, anger for pain. And I think it's important that we as a community know the difference, right? Um, people will just, I was a terrible kid in junior high. Like I was the worst kid in junior high. And when I look back, um, I, I often wonder, was I, was I like a bad kid, or did my teachers not know how to like, how did, how did you know, did they not know how to uh, connect with me, right? Did, I, I had one teacher, one black teacher, all from the time I got to Corona in the sixth grade up until graduating from high school, I had one black teacher. And it was the teacher who had the biggest impact on me. It was a teacher that when I got in all that trouble with junior high at CFIS, they put me in the basement. Last quarter of the, the last quarter of the school year, they're like, you're too bad, go to the basement. And in the basement was a black teacher. Her name was Miss Ensley. And she had the biggest impact for at least five years. Um, and it, maybe because it was just me and her in the basement, right? And <laughs> I don't know. But that's how bad I was. But <laughs> to, 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 make, to make the point, I, I do think that there's, there's issues that, and, and trauma that our youth are dealing with. I don't have kids. But I can I can speak to some of the, you know to some of the young men that I work with, and uh, I think Z and what he does with the Explorers program and what he does with Lila Project. I mean, he's working with kids that the Lila Project works with are at his high school, so he'll see them at our events and then he'll see them at at school. So he could say, "Hey, not only are you in trouble here, but I'm going to tell Dom when I get back." And then you know, so. Um, the dynamic is, is very important, but it, it, it's also something that we should definitely talk about. And, and to be fair, this is a day of, um, uh, this is an age of where mental issues are at the forefront for all of our kids, everybody, um, red, yellow, black, uh, and white, um, but specifically to, to race or race issues, the race trauma, trauma caused um, by, um, uh, um, race and race issues. It's very prevalent in a community like this. And that has to be heard and that has to be said in a community where the numbers uh, for black students are small. You know, I get the calls all the time. I've been in education. I was an instructor, a teacher at Santiago in 06. But I've been an instructor. This is year 33 for me in teaching and education. 20 here in Corona. Every year. Every year I get parents calling saying, my, you know, my, my, my daughter was called this N-word. Well, how do I deal with that? What do I do with that? Where do I take her? How do I talk to her? How do I, every single year, we deal with that. We're dealing with that. And so we have to hear that. In Corona, with the smaller numbers, with minority uh, kids, they are dealing with that. And it's not just traumatizing the child. Mama's traumatized. Daddy's traumatized. The family's traumatized. What do we do? How do we do this? 
How do we deal with this? Um, and so to, to, to understand the seriousness of that, um, we need to see that it affects, there's a ripple effect. It affects everybody, affects all of us. And um, so my, my question becomes then, um, if, if, how, do we, how do we deal with uh, our kids dealing, I mean, going through those things? How do we, or what do we do, what do we say to our kids who are dealing with these things? What do we say to the teachers or the other parent or the other solution? I, I don't have kids, but I, I remind the, the men that I work with that they're kings. I remind them, I, I try to empower them. Um, I remind them of the culture. And when I say the culture, I mean black people are in, in just in culture in general. I mean, I honestly feel like if people loved black culture as they, as they, as they love black people, I think we'd be in a different place. People love black culture. People love hip hop. They love everybody in here danced during the, I mean, maybe not everybody. <laughs> Most of you guys, and there's some that probably tried and failed, but most of you guys danced in the Super Bowl, right? And, and most of you guys um, have, have a black friend, but there is a difference between having a black, knowing a black person and having a black friend. And if you can't empathize what we go through as a culture, then you don't have black friends. You just know black people. Okay, so um, I just... Remind the kids that I work with that they're kings, that they're part of the culture, that that it starts with them, that that they're worth it, um, to be proud, to be you know unapologetically themselves everywhere they go, at all times. Um, yeah, I went to Santiago, <laughs> so of course there were times. Thank you, thank you, to my sharks. Um, there were times that I wanted to fit in. Um, however. My parents played a vital role into uh, always validating who I was as an individual, um, which then helped me find my role in leadership and helped me to uh, be comfortable in my own skin and, and being who I was going to be, regardless of who liked me and who didn't, right? Um, with my kids, I've educated them uh, to speak freely at a young age. Kids are the most honest people you will meet. And oftentimes, as parents, we try to limit the things that they say, right? Because they're telling you the truth. You know, if you, you're 50 years old and you're missing a tooth and you see them, they're going to say, hey, why are you missing that tooth, right? Um, and it's the truth. And sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So what we do is we just sharpen the way that they deliver the message. And so with my children, um, I ask them for their trust. Um, and I ask them to trust me because I trust you. And it's a relationship, and that's how we build it. Um, because when you experience uh, these emotional pitfalls, um, as a child, you don't know how to deal with it. And you don't want to go to your parents because you have a friend or someone else that you can go uh, talk to the, to the matter about. Um, but as long as that trust is there and they know that they can speak freely without, without judgment, um, then they'll come to you when they experience these um, emotional traumas. And, and make them, give them emotional intelligence and let them know what it is to be emotionally aware of what they are feeling and help them understand why they are feeling that way. Um, when my daughter falls, right, and she starts crying, I'm like, what's going on? Okay, you're crying? You got a boo-boo? Oh, no, 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 I don't have a boo-boo. It just hurt. Okay, I'll do a little magic powder dust. And she's like, it's all better. It's mental. Got it. We got to bypass that one. So that way, as we're building that trust, I know when she legitimately comes to me as she gets older, that she came to me with something that was real and authentic, right? And it affected her not only physically, mentally, but emotionally as well. Yeah. Interesting that the solutions that you've, uh, that you've all spoken to, the solutions have centered around you and her. Uh, you, education. And, and, pardon me? And education, teaching them. Because your first instinct when they come home to tell you that that happened is to go all South Central on them. I mean, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, whoa. And then you have to like calm down and take it down a notch. And you just need to go to the school and you need to find out what happened and you need to solve it like a regular human being. Mm -hmm. So education. But my, 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 um, my question, though, my point was that 
you, we have looked at the solution on our side. This is what the black parent should do. This is what the black mentor should do. This is what we're doing. If the problem is on the other side too, how come we haven't addressed the other side? How do we address the other side also? Education. I mean, black history is American history. Yeah. All right. Proximity. 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 I mean, you got to be around them. You got to be around people, uh, people that don't share the same common views of you, people as you, people that are different, people that speak. I mean, that's why New York is is a beautiful place, right? There's so much diversity. You learn from other cultures. You learn from other religions. Um, I just, I, I think proximity is important. Being proactive about having those people around you. That dinner table has to look different. Not, at some time, at some point. Um, I, I think it's important to also recognize that as, as blacks, we have this, this stigma and this aura of how we deal with individuals, each other, right? When we see other black males, you know, it's normally like a size up, you know? And uh, my mentor, Joe Polino, uh, has always told me, a smile and a greeting is the best way to disarm somebody. Um, and we don't do that enough. You know, um, it's important that we acknowledge each other, you know. Um, outside of my uniform, if I took off this suit, well, with, with clothes on, obviously, um, <laughs> you wouldn't know I was a cop, and most people don't, you know. And I could walk into any neighborhood, and you might associate me with a gang or, you know, hey, look at this dude. Um, but I think it's important that we speak to each other. Um, we, we, we have that... Um, owed to us, you know, because this is always a you conversation, a you versus you, right? And you make a choice not to speak to somebody. And every time that you wake up, you're guaranteed two things, a chance and a choice. And what you do with that chance is always going to be your choice. Yeah, and I think it's, I think it's, it's, not our, it's not our right. It's our duty to create change. Uh, and I, and I, I can attest to, to what Z's saying. I mean, for me, I, I say what's up to everybody. Um, I was I was taught, and I feel like if if I'm walking to a gas station and someone's tatted head to toes, I want to say what's up to them. I want them to know that I see them, right? Like I see you, I respect you. How you doing? Um, I say what's up to everybody, and I think that I agree with Z wholeheartedly that that's something that we need to do more is to to greet one another, even if it's a head nod. I mean, all my people out there know the black head nod. I get the black head nod. We know what it is. Everybody does it, but we need to do what everybody, everyone needs to do that, right? Universally, that would be cool. My, my daughter asked me once, she said, Daddy, she was little, she said, Daddy, why no matter where we go, every time you see somebody black, you say hello, you say hi, you do something, but, every, but you don't do that with everybody else. She challenged me, right? She challenged me. I'm, I moved here in 2001. I was not comfortable until I saw the first black person. That's the truth. I need to see that we're here and that we're around. Now, now I'm a little more comfortable. And I'm, all, I'm quick to look for it. We, we do it. We do, we do that. And I'm quick to look for it. Um, but my daughter challenged me. She says, well, why do you just do it to the black people or with black folk? Uh, I, I don't know. You know I'm, I'm comfortable with it. But she challenged me. And I've had to learn to say, hello, you're not this way with black folk. You're not this way with white folk. You know? <laughs> that's, that's what you do. You tip your head. You do, you do. It's different. There's gestures. And, and so, okay, all right, that's what, <laughs> that's what we're going to do. But I've had to teach myself to do it intentionally, to be intentional about it, to be purposeful about it. Everybody, everybody gets a greeting. I like, th I like that. Everybody gets a greeting, but I had to teach myself. I had to be challenged by a little girl who saw it, who saw what I was doing and saw what I wasn't doing um, at the same time. And, so. and to Z's point, kids are honest. His daughter, I don't know how many times, has poked my stomach and said, Dominic needs to get in the gym. <laughs> and, and so I avoid her. I avoid her every time. Yeah, yeah. And I avoid the gym. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 want to, I want to go to the, the, the next question, and I think I'm going to rush on to, um, I, I wanted to embed it in the conversation, but um, I, I, it's been my fault for not being able to do that. But I want to look back on this evening, and I want folks to hear and know, too, from your perspective, um, the city of Corona, you know, they're doing something. They're doing some, what, what, what are they doing right what, what do we need to work on? What do we need to, what are we doing well? What have we done well? What do we really need to work on? Um, so I want to start to wrap up the conversation with, you know, um, um, on, on that level, specifically the city of Corona. How, how are we doing? 
for black folk? How we do? Um, my experience with the city of Corona started on the Metrolink train. I mean, um, I worked in Los Angeles. I never had the opportunity to work in Corona and got up at 4.30 in the morning on the 4.45 train to Los Angeles. So I met a lot of people from Corona and a lot of neighbors. And um, we still have relationships today. I mean, we had movie night. I mean, they've retired and moved away. We still meet out for lunch. And um, they were some of the nicest people I'd ever met. So my experience with fellow Coronians has always been positive, including my neighbors who live around me. And I'm extremely lucky now that I live on a cul-de-sac where there are 15 of us, and we're very, very close. So I've never had a, a bad experience in Corona. Um, I speak from experience. Um, the city of Corona has been very instrumental in assisting this young black man um, with opening corridors, you know, and providing me with educational tools to be able to run a business. You know, I was 19 years old, didn't know where to start. I went down to the city and said, hey, I'm trying to start a business. How do I do it? And they walked me through every step, you know. Um, and from there, you know, I, I grew to 150 employees. Um, and so also I think it's important to recognize that the city of Corona did one of the biggest things for black history um, by electing someone like Dominic Beretti. Shout out to Ms. Casillas back there. Um, because you, you gave a, a, a man of color a seat at the table, right? And uh, you're talking about a man who can orchestrate treaties amongst local gang leaders and then turn around and provide assistance to the less fortunate families and at-risk youth. Uh, these are people needed in our system to challenge the system and be the voice for those who don't have one. Um, the Corona Police Department, um, very empathetic when my brother was murdered in 2013 in the city of Corona, um, came to my house with compassion um, it wasn't just another case. Um, so that, that definitely uh, impacted me and um, helped with my perception of the city of Corona. Now, um, as far as some things that I think that the city can do better, um, and it's not narrowed down to just the city of Corona, but I live in Corona, right? Uh, it's be intentional on providing a platform um, to address valid concerns of your community that wants to be heard. Um, create opportunities through educational programs outside your standard educational system, um, such as financial literacy, entrepreneurship, mentorship programs, and, and get it done um, without excuse. My experience in Corona, uh, give a round of applause, that's great. I know Z touched on it, but it, it is important to, his story is incredible, his dad's, his dad's a former, if I, could, if I could say, his dad's a former gang member, um, not low level. His dad was a guy, and he changed his life. He had Z and his brother, he changed his life, and now is a public defender, put himself through law school, uh, did exactly what Z did. Z paid for himself to go to the police academy, um, and I was at his graduation when he got, when he, when he graduated, and they named him number one, like the number one recruit overall, and we went crazy. I mean, because that's important. Because um, we, we saw his hard work and everything he put in, um, but for me, Corona Corona has been a great experience. I haven't I can't sit here even though there are some issues that, that I spoke of earlier. Um, there are places in Corona that make me feel like home. I am proud of Corona. I think Corona is the best city in the Inland Empire. When people ask me from out of state, hey, you know, you live out in IE, where do you think? Where's a good place? I tell them all the time, don't move here, don't move there, move to Corona, come to Corona. Like and I and I say that proudly, not because I'm on the parks on the parks. I I genuinely think that Corona is definitely moving in the in the right right direction. Um, and my experience as a youth, as a as a young as a young black man, I think like Z trying to find our way. Right? Our experience is different from Shirley's, right? Um, because of age, we're trying we're trying to we're trying to figure out our way, right? We we came through a whole other era. Where I feel like I think J Cole said that he was stuck in the middle of two generations. I think it's important that we, I understand the youth, but I also respect my elders, and I hear them, and I see them, and I know those expectations. Um, so for me, Corona has been great, but there are things, like, like there's always a but, right? But I think Z harped on it. There's some things that we need to be more intentional about. And um, obviously, I think that we do need a black police officer here. We need a black cop. Um, we need more, we, 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 need, we need more Arab, 
police officers. We need more um, Hispanic. Of, 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 it doesn't matter what gender, male or female. I, it's important because I want to be able to say, you know, hey, Corona, I'm proud of Corona. Corona's police department is A1. Their fire department's A1. Jackie and, and Wes and the entire account are, are amazing people. I, there's, I have trust. And because, like Z said, there are, there are bits and parts of this community that, that you guys might not know that I know, that I know and I know them on a personal level. So it's my responsibility to be, uh, to be real. To be, they, they need to trust me. So when I go out and a couple months, a couple months ago, I, there was a gang situation. Both guys happened to go to the same high school as me. They didn't go to Santiago, they went to Centennial. Um, they went to the same high school as me. They're both grown men with kids, and they said, Dom, this has been brought to our attention. There's been some lines crossed. Uh, we can trust you. Can you help us figure this out? And we don't want any, anything this to go any further. We got kids. We're past this. I sat down with them in a restaurant in Corona, and, and we figured it out. And I think that that just tells you how close-knit people in Corona are, that someone in my space could, has, has still, could still connect with people in all different walks of life. And I, I think it's important that if one thing is, is learned tonight is that Corona does need to be more of a family, that we do. But with that, with that being said, we need to have these conversations. Um, these conversations are so important. And um, to wrap up my point, I, I want to, before I forget, because I'm going to forget, Denzel, can we give a round of applause to Denzel in the back? He, he, him, him along, him along with, with, a, with a lot of other people put this together, and, and uh, I probably was a headache to Denzel because I asked a million questions because it was important for me to know that this was a space of transparency that I could, that Z and Shirley and myself could be, you know, authentic. Because we're not here to make anybody feel comfortable, we're here to make people. We're here to be authentic. So, I just want to give you know mad props to to Denzel for all the hard work and the rest of the team, whoever puts this together. I, I really, really appreciate it. And th this is what Corona is about, and this is the, the, the direction Corona needs to go. Oh, Thank you to our city council too. We have a wonderful city council that engages with people. Jackie, Wes, uh, Tom. Uh, who else is here? Mr. Steiner. So um, I'm grateful to all of them. The police chief, <laughs> the fire chief. Um, I think this is, they engage. So Absolutely. You, you, you guys are wrapping it up, and I got one more question. I got one more thing, I got one more thing to say. <laughs> um, how does the city of Corona then um, play a role? What role does the city of Corona play in developing a better connection with the black community? What, what, can, what can they do? So we've, you've, you've, you've sung some praises. There's some, a lot of good things that are happening. Um, but we need a better connection. Um, or do we? What, what, does this, what can the city do to build better connections with the black community? Well, I think the city council's made a good first step. I mean, I didn't know Jackie before I was appointed to the um, library board. They took a chance on me. I mean, I, did, I wasn't very active in the city. I wasn't known in the city. And they took a chance. And elected me on the board. So I think they're making steps. Mm -hmm. So I applaud them for that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Uh, when Jackie gave me a call and said, hey, uh, I keep hearing some good stuff about you, I told him those were all lies. <laughs> and, and I, you know, and Z, Z had a good point. I, when Jackie asked uh, for me if, if I was interested in the position, you know, I was, I was uh, kind of impartial at first because I didn't know what it, what it entailed. And, but more importantly, I knew that the pressure that it would cause, even, even though it's, you know, I knew that it would, that people in my community would say, hey, Dom, once you get there, do this, do that. They don't understand that. That's just not how it works, right? And uh, I'm just doing the best, I, like, best as I can, as much as I can right now. But um, I think, like you said, just connecting, connecting with people. I do think, I do applaud the city council and, and, and the fire department and the police department. Um, but yeah, I, that's pretty much where I'm at right now. Outstanding, outstanding. I want to leave the tonight by saying thank you to, to Jackie, and to Wes, and to, um, and to uh, Denzel um, for pushing and encouraging, uh, encouraging all of us to do this and putting this on as well. And I want to end by asking you the question, um, just to get to know you better, family. What called you forth? What do you, what do you hear in this time, in this space, in this place for? What called you forth 
and let's do this family thing. Let's, let's, let's do this for family, all right? Thank you very much for this evening. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Denzel. Thank you very much for having us and uh, coming out.